All right, hello everyone. Today we have uh, Enrico Palmarino with us. He's the founder and CEO of Botkeeper, which is an AI-driven bookkeeping automation company. Uh, he graduated with honors from Babson College with a Bachelor of Science in Quantitative Methods, Entrepreneurship, and Strategic Management. Enrico has been ranked among the top 30 most inspiring business leaders, as well as one of the 100 most influential people in accounting. Before Botkeeper, Enrico's background uh, has been in automation, decision trees, and accounting. Uh, while in college, Enrico co-founded ThinkLight, which automated lighting analysis, design, and manufacturing. ThinkLight grew from a company started in a dorm room to number 46 on the Inc. 500 list and resulted in, 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 resulted in Enrico being ranked second amongst America's top 25 entrepreneurs under 25 by Bloomberg Business Week. After successfully exiting ThinkLight, Enrico invested in and helped grow a cloud accounting, a cloud accounting firm from seven to 40 people in just three years. Uh, and outside of the Botkeeper, Enrico is an investor and advisor of several businesses and venture funds. He also sits on the Technology Advisory Committee and Board of Corporators at Fidelity Bank. Uh, in his personal life, he enjoys spending time with his wife, two daughters and dogs, as well as binge watching, one of my favorite pastimes these days, um, on movies and TV, skiing with friends, brainstorming with other entrepreneurs, and relaxing in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, interestingly, Enrico, uh, via Botkeeper, raised $25 million um, in funding led by Point72. Uh, thanks for joining us, Enrico. Thank you, Darius. Appreciate it. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So to hop in, you know, one of the things I think is very interesting about your background is you did not start with, you know, a, a degree in computer science, right? Um, you didn't get a PhD in artificial intelligence, but somehow you've built this company <laughs> and, and have been one of the few who, who is deploying a, a market ready AI product. Um, can you take us back to a couple of your, your, your first ventures and then talk us through the point where you decided AI was something that was going to be critical as a, as a next step for you? Sure. Um, so I think for, for me, uh, you know, AI, there's two sides to it, right? You have the computer science side and you also have the mathematics side. And I was always a very math heavy person. So like quant, uh, a lot of the algorithms that potentially drive the decisions uh, in, in machine learning come from their, their mathematical equations, uh, not necessarily like a computer language programming. And so for me, I always was uh, fascinated with math, was fascinated with the fact that you could build uh, or write algorithms that you know, would, would output a result given a set of variables. Um, and, and then also had a fascination with decision trees like love the idea that you could, you know, throw those variables into some, uh, you know, complex decision trees and, you know, automate, uh, automate away work that you'd be doing. Uh, in, in college, the lighting business that uh, we built was predominantly based on this idea of mathematical formulas and, mm. and decision trees to, that could process a large amount of data, you know, across various databases and do something in a matter of uh, hours that would take weeks or months for people to typically do. And then I think uh, uh, getting into uh, the, the AI realm, our approach since the beginning was always that like AI is a tool of, of many um, that, you know, it's not the magic silver bullet, I think that uh, people make it out to be. And so the combination of like well thought out software workflows, integrations, decision trees, algorithms, and AI could yield uh, great efficiencies um, and, and automate away a lot of work. But the caveat being was I never trusted it wholeheartedly and like and totally. Mm. So uh, since the get go and we, we always paired any of the AI as being like a, a, a human assisted AI model where it, it, was either, it was either doing a very small part of the workflow or like a piece of the workflow and then another piece was done by human and then maybe another piece done by machine. And, and so it was, you know, you were chunking or segmenting um, aspects that were automating, or it was doing a lot of the heavy lifting and then a human was verifying the output before proving the result. And what I found in the accounting space, having fortunately spent like some time in accounting uh, and, and managing and running an accounting firm before jumping into building an automated accounting solution was that 
the customer service side of accounting is super important and you have to be very customer centric. And so if you were to build a product that was this, you know, call it hands off, like human touch off solution, a lot of people wouldn't actually really enjoy uh, that result because they want that interaction. They want the advice. They want the feedback from the human. They want the high level of customer service that comes with what is traditionally a human advisor. And so we, we made sure that like we very much structured our company to be human assisted AI. And like, we like to say that it's like better than machines, better than humans, automation with a human touch. Um, and we found that to actually work really well uh, for, for our company. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. And that's a, that's a great segue into talking about product. I know um, when I got my career started at KPMG on their, on their audit team, you know, we had just started in, you know, implementing software uh, into, into the company, into audit processes. Right. And, and so back then there was a lot of talk of, you know, Hey, listen, at some point, you know, we may be able to leverage technology to do a lot of the things that you consider ridiculously boring, right? Such yeah. as ticking and tying, spending an entire day ticking and tying, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it sounds like you guys are doing, you know, a lot of those tasks. So if you could just take us through um, the core product or products yeah. and, and really key in on the, on the key value prop to the customer. Sure. Um, so I think it, it all stems from this idea that we're trying to optimize the human, not replace the human. Um, and that's important because I think like if you look right now in the accounting world, there the demand for accounting services and work far out see, exceeds the supply of humans available to do the work or the time and the day to get it done. Um, and what that means is that like you're starting to see uh, like the, the customer centricity drop because it's like you're just spending so much time processing the, the work and getting the result, which is like, you know, completed financials, but then not, you know, I think if you survey most accounts, they'll tell you they spend 90 plus percent of the time getting the data in and the, the books closed and maybe five or 10% of the time actually reviewing the end result to make sense of what does this mean for a business? And so trying to give more time, more of that time back to give a better result that's impactful and going to move, move the needle. So, so for BotKeeper, the two things that we wanted to solve for Number one, simplifying the app stack. So there's an over amplification that's taken place in the accounting world. There's an app for everything these days. There's an app for doc storage, an app for communication, an app for invoicing, an app for bill pay, an app for receipt capture, an app for bank statement fetching, an app for you know, so on and so forth. And those apps don't talk to each other. You're lucky if they talk to the GL. But what this means is like a typical accountant or accounting firm has to manage a ton of different applications and a master Excel sheet to know which clients are using what applications and where, because neither of the applications give them a holistic view of their client base and all the interactions that come with it. So there is a, a too many app problem. And if you really look at what those apps are, uh, are doing is it's a data exchange. You're either, it's an app that's pulling data from a client and getting it to the accountant in an automated fashion, or an app that's taking data from an accountant or from a GL and serving that data back to the client in a uh, fashion that makes more sense of it or that visualizes that data in a way that's easier to digest and interpret. So first, what we wanna do is consolidate that app stack and basically uh, create a unified platform that acts as the data exchange. And then the second part was if you look at the way accounting work is done, you've got, let's say that data exchange, the human, me sitting in the middle, and then the GL, uh, which is where the, the database that stores the, the final financial data. And a human has to sit in the middle and do all the treatment and the accounting processing of that data that comes from the exchange, get in the GL and then be the middleman back to the app to like serve up the, the end result. And our thought was if you could take, uh, if you could use machine learning software uh, and, and algorithms to automate a lot of that processing, you kind of marry the data exchange with the, uh, with the GL, with, with the software sitting in between doing a lot of the processing. And, and remove the human from being the middleman to being the supervisor or operator of that machine. Right. And I like to like uh, relate that to the auto industry, which used to have assembly lines of people manually making cars. Two, the next evolution was give those people tools to make them assemble cars faster. To today's uh, state is massive heavy machinery, robotics, 
doing mass production and assembly with a supervisor human operator managing that machine. And then you have skilled artisans that come in and do the finishing touches and the detail. So for us, the skilled artisans are the accountants that still exist today. The supervisor operators are bot keepers, staff and humans and the machine that's mass outputting is, uh, is, the, is the bot keeper software uh, platform and result. Okay, and so, awesome. So the, the, the product kind of walk you through it real quick. So we, we have that data exchange, we're getting data in the form of, of documents, connections to bank accounts, credit cards, payroll integration, so on and so forth. So financial data extraction, we run it through the machine learning to do categorization, classification, uh, receipt capture. So OCR transposition of data off of receipts and documents, bill pay and approval workflows, uh, pushing the end result into, uh, into QuickBooks or, or zero as a GL. And then having our humans kind of be looking at those results that are coming through, validating, approving, and verifying, or flagging for uh, uh, anomalies uh, and doing like anomaly detection to then okay. be pushed back to the accountant to resolve the uniques and not have to be supervising every transaction. Right. And then what that does is it speeds up the ability to close and process transactional data and allows the skilled artesian or the accountant in this case that lives at the accounting firm to be using what we provided to assist in complicated accounting, such as like call it complex deferrals, accruals, prepaids, you know, waterfalls, reporting, dashboards, and advisory and consulting. Okay, okay, awesome. And, and what were the early days like uh, of the product? I mean, um, did you start out with, with static code or, or, or was this you know, AI driven from, from day one? So it was, uh, it was, I'd say, workflow, decision tree, and data extraction driven. So it was like, let's grab as much data from our clients as we can, organize it in a manner that allows like the appropriate workflows to take place, use that data and uh, say like, you know, the earliest levels of machine learning to do some processing of that data and whether that be like even the further organization of the data, tagging it with, uh, with metadata, running it through different decision tree workflows, syncing of data um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and managing levels of approval and call it human machine interaction. So okay. I get it from here, the human steps in and does something and then ticks off or checks something that then you know, completes the, the workflow. Um, two, once we had get, gathered enough data uh, from, from the client base, really start now optimizing the machine learning models to be trying to do more and more of the work themselves with less and less human oversight or verification. So where are we going to start setting the threshold where we trust the machine right, versus right. like we trust, but want to verify the machine versus so, where we don't trust the machine at all. And we want to like totally do it manually. Right. So did you start off with folks doing this, this, this work manually and then gradually, you know, you scale up to the point where you, you're trusting the machines or the models um, to give you the right recommendations, you know, for journal entries, you know, or, or so it, it was never, it was never like a, a hard cut over. So it was like, right. you always had manual efforts uh, since the beginning. Like there was always a team of human accountants and uh, data validators. And what we were constantly doing was like, looking at every single thing that the, that team was doing and just automating away bits and pieces and bits and pieces a little bit more and then tuning and tweaking the machine learning models and starting to i'd say like through through confidence ratings improving starting to allow some level of transactions to be processed without human supervision and then starting to like slowly increase that as we saw as as long as we saw the confidence levels maintaining and that we weren't seeing like the machine kind of regressing or training itself down. So it's just like, it's just like, you know, fine line or balancing act of slowly allowing the machine to do more. But then the whole time that we're watching our people do work, we're pulling away like individual workflows. So this, you know, special report that gets created for a number of clients, like we're going to automate how that gets produced. These requests that come in from clients at a high frequency, like we're going to automate how those get routed. Uh, and, and ideally like use some level of natural language processing to like bucket or kick off the appropriate workflow to serve back the answer uh, that the client might be asking. Got it. So it sounds like in, in, in automating some of those tasks, 
Um, you know, you had the humans doing some of the work at first, some of the work at first, but um, you, you were using a bit of robotic process automation to then step in and those tasks, you would just watch how they would complete each task and then eventually automate that. I'd say robotic process automation with machine learning helping to drive, yeah. drive that. So um, because I think robotic process automation in itself is like a very static thing that requires mm -hmm. like heavy manual intervention to keep updating. So our idea is like, well, if you could put some machine learning at the front of robotic process automation, you could allow it to be tweaked or nuanced over time right. instead of just have it be these static builds. But I think that the, the key difference is that you see a lot of companies fail where they build a totally manual solution. And then they say like, now I'm gonna go and automate that. But it'd be like, you've ingrained manual into every aspect, like even like the workflows or how the database right. is, like all of those things depend on manual workflows, whereas out of the gate, we were fighting for building automation into every manual workflow with, and structuring it in a way that like we could eventually reduce it down to zero or some, some uh, nominal amount of human effort. Yeah, yeah. And um, so one of the things that I found interesting is you have a, a pretty global team. Yep. Um, and so how did you think about, you know, establishing that team and, and what's the communication like? Um, given that you know you guys are all on different time zones, uh, obviously we're forced forced into a remote work environment right now, so it probably helps that you had, you had that from the inception. But want to hear more about the team dynamics? Yeah, I think for for us, um, we there there came a point where we decided it was kind of like two things. It was like we knew we were going to have a, an overseas team to be doing and assisting with the data validation and verification because we we needed some level of uh, uh, continuous round the clock monitoring and like right. hiring uh, people who have accounting backgrounds uh, yeah. to work like night shift in the US or like the graveyard shift like forget it like this is not a thing like we, we tried it and found no one like no matter what we basically paid no one wanted those jobs and so that meant we got to find a geography where where our night shift is their day shift and they'll be they'll work harmoniously and allow us to like have this continuous monitoring Otherwise, you get backlogs. So, like, if if we're if the machine is processing a whole bunch of work and requires a human to verify and assist, but that human's only coming online at 8 a.m. every day, you built up this massive backlog that you're always fighting with uh, to process. So we just we needed continuous processing, so that pushed a, a necessary global model. Um, and then the second part was from even geo in the U.S. Uh, and looking at other countries we made a decision early on that it was just, we want to hire the best people regardless of where they are right. and then build the software and the management of our company such that we can effectively work with those people. And if you hire mm -hmm. people who either coming into it or have, have backgrounds of working remotely or and have that as like the expectation that it's a work from remote, you're not really changing behavioral, behavioral structure. You're not taking a, someone who was used to coming to the office and saying, I need you to work just as effectively from the home, which you might never have done. Uh, so it, it was an important part for us to just get the best people, regardless of where they where they were located. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of that with uh, folks we work with on the data, uh, da the data labeling side. Um, you know, that's something that traditionally you ask a data scientist to do um, the data labeling, and it's I mean they, you know do it, but it's not something. There's, there are things that are a lot more interesting, similar to the scenario when I was talking about ticking and tying. Uh, when you're a CPA, it's not generally the thing you want to be doing. Um, so then, if you can offer that opportunity to other folks, um, that's always is something that that's inter interesting to explore. Yeah, and for for us, it was like a, a big part of it too was made, like ensuring a really high degree of accuracy. So like we wanted to strive for perfection, like knowing that like it's impossible to achieve perfection. How close could we get? So we average three nines and a six in terms of accuracy. I, so it's like 99.96% accurate, which is, wow. you know, pretty much as, as good as any accounting transaction has ever got. Like that's, that's yeah. unachievable by human alone. <laughs> you guys um, have already crossed materiality, that materiality threshold. Yeah. And we still, we still are pushing to try to get that six to a seven and an eight. Um, yeah. But the, uh, but one of the ways we were able to do that was, you know, I think a lot of uh, AI companies in the U.S. where they, you don't have a global team and you can't take advantage of potentially lower cost resources, you're, you're forced to like push the machine to start doing a level of work 
entirely by itself without that verification step. And then okay. what you run into is issues where like the models start to potentially regress or train down, or they only achieve a, you know, 80 something percent accuracy or, and that's just not acceptable in accounting. Like, 85% accurate financials or 90% financials are, <laughs> are not financials. So, yes. uh, so we, we'd rather basically bring on the extra staff needed to look at every single thing we do until we have that like utmost level of confidence. And then even then just kind of start ticking down slowly uh, what transactions we're not looking at. Okay. So in terms of, um, I'm curious when you hired your first, um, you know, true data, data scientists, machine learning engineers, um, at what point did that come? And, you know, how do you navigate the um, high cost and, and shortage of talent in, in that, in, you know, this specific domain? So I think, you know, we, we did this, this scrappy thing, which was we, we tended to hire engineers who had data science backgrounds or had ML backgrounds. And so we were kind of leveraging, like we weren't paying for a specialty resource. We were paying for resources that had the understanding of both and that could do a little bit of both. I think that's honestly, uh, in hindsight, that was probably one of the best decisions we made because it meant that like how we were building workflows and how we were looking at the data and then how we were engineering uh, the, the, the software to, to ingest right. it and use it all were so assimilated and tied together and not like I did my thing, I throw it over the wall and now you do your thing. Um, it, the, the you know, downside is like if the data science to it or the ML models might not have been running at the utmost level of efficiency, but that's something that you can like tweak and improve and you can do incrementally and get great results out of, but that, that materially change the level of automation, but that, uh, that to really do it fast you had to have all the underlying call it like infrastructure and, and, and data pipelines and workflows and things assimilated. So we, we started first with people that had were multifaceted and then only recently I'd say in like the last year and a half um, or so I really started hiring like specialists and pure data science roles or specialists that are like purely focused on the machine learning to like to take it and optimize it and get the next level out of it. Okay, awesome. Um, I want to I want to kind of change directions here and talk about go to market. Um, if you could take us back to the early days, you know, when you acquired your your first client, um, you know, what was what was the process of acquiring that first client? And I think you know later we can talk a little bit about uh, what the go to market is today. But curious what that what that looked like. So we uh, our our vision and goal was to build this you know automated platform for accounting firms but accounting firms are laggard adopters of tech yeah. <laughs> and very cautious about anything they touch their clients with and have a very low level of trust, I think, for anything new. So uh, we, we knew we first had to get SMB clients uh, uh, to prove that it worked. So like we could have a number of happy SMB clients and we hadn't destroyed their businesses and, and, uh, and the efficiencies were there. Then we could show that uh, as a data point to the accounting firm to say, you can trust this with your clients as well. Um, and so the, we, we went out to get the, you know, called the first batch of clients. A lot of that was, you know, word of mouth, relationships, trust, people that we knew, entrepreneurs, um, you know, selling directly to, to SMBs. Uh, it gets incrementally hard once you step out of like connections that you have or even secondary degree of connections to selling to people who have never heard of, right. don't know any of the people that are running the company and are purely buying based on, on the, the software, it's a different level of sale. So we, we evolved that sale process, but then hit, you know, finally hit like the, the turning point the threshold where we had enough uh, a data, enough clients that it was proving successful on and had had the first couple beta accounting firms running on BotKeeper to then be able to get more accounting firms to buy in the doc. Yeah. Uh, and, cor and correct me if I'm wrong here. It sounds like the approach you took in terms of getting that first batch of clients is perhaps you or, or some of the other founders, but I, I, you have a, you have a background in, you know, businesses that have done bookkeeping services for before. So you were able to leverage that experience, that network uh, to find those first people who you could at least test the product on, who would at least be able be willing to pay um, uh, to get those case studies and then you were able to leverage that to go with clients who had never heard of you before. 
Is, is that what is that a correct summarization? Yeah, I'd say it's like the, the first batch of clients really came from just being in the entrepreneurial circuits. So it was like okay. less the fact that I had accounting background and experience and more that like as an entrepreneur, I had entrepreneur friends and connections. So like I was part of a number of entrepreneurial organizations. I knew a bunch of businesses. I knew a bunch of the founders of them. I was able to reach out and say, hey, like doesn't, you know, isn't, <laughs> doesn't bookkeeping suck? Like, isn't it hard? <laughs> Are you guys having the same problem? Because like I had a business, hard sell. <laughs> yeah, I had a business before this one too, and it and that's why you know we built this solution was to solve that problem, um, and so that helped you know get the the first number of clients. And then I think in that, as I was looking to like build this solution for accounting firms, it meant we were going to I was going to like a ton of accounting conferences, and I started to like network and get to know the accounting community and the channel and and the people and players in it. And then through those relationships, kind of the same way I leverage the entrepreneurial relationships, go to them and say, hey, would you be willing to like try this? Like I've got some proof points that it works. You've now gotten to know me or, you know, trust me right. um, and make, you know, a, a low, low barrier to trying, like just try it, just use it for your clients on. If you like it, we'll talk about how, you know, how much you should pay for it or what it's yeah. worth to you. Um, and we'll figure that out later. But like, if it's not providing value, but then, you know, don't, then maybe just keep giving us feedback until we can get it to provide you enough value that you're willing to pay for it. Right. Okay. Now, very helpful. Very helpful. And so today, um, do you have more of a marketing driven go to market or, or, or is it kind of, are you leveraging a larger sales team? So we, we've got today, we've got a whole uh, sales, customer success, deployment, growth, you know, expansion, marketing team. I mean, we've got a, a pretty big sales and marketing organization at this point. Um, and it's headed by, uh, you know, a guy who really knows, like, you know, one of the best in class when it comes to uh, building uh, uh, sales and, and, and marketing, a guy named Chris Mull, uh, who was, uh, you know, at early days, you know, on the board with, with Benny Hoff at Salesforce. Like, okay. He has, you know, two awesome. IPOs and a few, you know, multi-hundred and billion dollar exits under his belt. And so he's really come in and like transformed and, and built our sales and marketing team into like a very a world-class organization. Right, great. right. As a more professionalized organization. And we have certifications. You have to go through like sales certifications <laughs> to be able to like sell the product. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much professionalized. There are, you know, stages that we follow. We you know, profiles of different buyers, um, the, the, the nine yards. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I, I, I a question that, that I love to ask everyone is, is, you know, if you had to go back or if you lost everything today, you had to start from ground zero, you had 90 days, um, to create a plan to get you back where you are now, what would you do? Uh, you know, I, th I think we would, um, if we lost everything, we, we, we just be, we jump right back into, uh, into the accounting market, um, and start just building up from there. You know, we, the, the direct side of our business was great. Like it was a, a necessary, you know, uh, stepping stone to get to, to the accounting market. Um, but we would, we jump back into the accounting circles and really be like, I'd say focused on the, the workflows, the user experience, the interaction of the product, what was needed to like drive the most value. Um, and probably hire, hire more, more people who are in accounting, uh, to be who the unicorns of sure. <laughs> people who had accounting degrees that happen to go computer science that to, to join our team and, and build some, some cool account tech product. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it sounds like for you all, um, building out the expertise around the software, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, would be a bigger lift if you started that earlier versus it sounds like kind of the sales and marketing piece was less of a hurdle for you in the early days. Uh, yeah. Or what I'd say is like really the, um, the, what we learned was taking really great engineers and product people and trying to teach them accounting is a Got tough it. thing. Um, and then what that ended up meaning was that we brought it, like we, you know, had accounting experts that we hired and that were on the team that were working closely with them and that hand in hand certainly helped. But if, when we have found this, you know, call it purple unicorn, someone who has like an accounting background or experience, 
that also that decided for whatever reason to shift and go computer science, programming, engineering, those people like are worth their weight in 10 X gold, right? Like, right. Uh, so, so instead of thinking of it as a purple unicorn that, you know, maybe we can find, or if we do great, like having that be the sole focus and just trying to have every person be a, a purple unicorn on the team, I think would be uh, a, a key initiative. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we, we, we see that a lot where if you can find someone who has, who sits at the nexus of your subject matter, you know, for the industry you're focused on, but can also understand the technical element of whatever you're building, right? Uh, that is kind of, because if you think about, you know, building machine learning al algorithms and the feature engineering that you need to do and the understanding of which features are important, that's, that, that's critical. And yeah, that's, that it's, it's also tough to find. <laughs> engineering with accounting domain expertise. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, well, thank you for, for taking time with us uh, today, Enrico. Where can we find you? Where, where, where should we look to if we want to learn more about what you guys are doing or perhaps get a demo? So if, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, what we're doing, you can go to www.botkeeper.com. And if you happen to be a purple unicorn and you have accounting domain expertise and are an engineer or in product, you can hit me up directly at Enrico at botkeeper.com. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Enrico. And, and we'll stay in touch. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Darius. Have a great rest of your day.